And on today's show, I am blessed to be joined by the one and only Stephanie Melodia. On the strategic side, actually take the complete opposite approach and actually really dial in to who exactly are you talking to the human brain versus artificial intelligence there is only so far it can go so that originality the inventiveness the creativity that's where humans can still have an edge against that you need to leave that alone for 6 12 18 months because not all marketing initiatives are going to be giving you that Snickers bar, short-term sugar fix in the afternoon. The digital explosion is finally calming down. What that then leads to is the holy grail of marketing. And this will be music to investors' ears as well for the founders, which is a zero pound CPA, AKA word of mouth marketing. Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. On this podcast, we talk to an amazing range of people. And we talk to these people about risk. Risk they've taken in their lives, risks they've taken in their careers, when they paid off, and when they didn't. So you're the CEO and founder of Bloom. You've been awarded top 20 female founders and so much inspirational content that you're putting out and helping others put out as well. So saying thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So we had our first conversation very, very recently. Um, it was amazing to, to hear about your background and, and a background which you know a lot of people will um, resonate with in terms of having to work and hustle and pull yourself up by the bootstraps along the way, lots of risks. And uh, I think it's a story, story which should really be shared with as many people as possible. So give us the very quick, you know, the quick run through of, of how you've got to where you are and, and let's go from there. Sure. So yeah, I had quite an unique upbringing. I was born in the UK, but moved over to the Canary Islands when I was nine years old with my family. And um, half Italian, hence the Melodia surname, grew up in the Canaries, so I'm now bilingual in Spanish, but can't speak uh, fluent Italian, which is a bit weird. Mm. And from there, really kind of found my way back to London through a roundabout way of twists and turns and via Madrid and Toronto and eventually found where I should be here in London. So a bit of a, bit of a unique background. Yeah, amazing. And that's that can't be easy moving around that much as a kid. The moving around wasn't as as difficult as actually the living in Lanzarote. Mm -hmm. I um I'm definitely a city girl, born and bred. London is the place for me and uh, since I've been back in London over the past decade, I obviously get the same reaction from people when I tell them I grew up on a desert island yeah. and this tourist hotspot and it's always the same. And obviously people have that image of this holiday resort and spending all your time on the beach mm -hmm. and drinking cocktails. And of course, it's not the reality. I still had to go to school. You have to pay taxes and all the rest of it. And yeah, so the reality of actually growing up on a small desert island was was not for me. I felt very unfulfilled, very unsatisfied, extremely frustrated. So it wasn't so much the moving about. It was just it was that frustration. Um, we came back to the UK when I was about 13, 14, which was for me, we managed to stay here for exactly 51 weeks, one week shy of a full year. <laughs> didn't didn't work out. And then I was awarded a scholarship to study art history in Madrid. Um, that didn't work out either. Um, kept boomeranging back to the island annoyingly just because it was where parents are based. Mm -hmm. Uh, then managed to escape the island again, uh, this time go even further flung over to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, okay, of course. <laughs> Obviously, where are you going to go next? And uh, that didn't work out either. And I had to swallow my pride and ask um, one of the very few people that I know who lived here if I could go and stay with them. It was my mm -hmm. godmother at the time. And I literally had nothing. Like I balanced two, three jobs. I was serving coffees as a barista. I was pulling pints in a pub. Mm -hmm. I was picking up kind of anything, earning whatever money I could to build things back up again, whilst also applying to jobs and getting the train into London at any opportunity. Interestingly, this was also at the tail end of the last recession. Mm -hmm. And so I'd had no connections. I'm not from the U wasn't from here. I didn't study in the UK. I didn't have any family or anything and uh, didn't 
didn't go through with that scholarship I mentioned before so I don't have a degree or anything to my name so quite a lot of odds that were stacked against me but kept going at it and what I thought would only take a few weeks actually took about nine months until I got my first job offer so that real hustle that I had to kind of go through um, lasted longer than expected and and then it was a whole other set of hustle when I eventually got to London and built up from there. Of course, of course. And so it sounds like there's been a lot of frustration yeah. in the early days. Mm. Like quite a few false starts, things which obviously you were hoping would have worked out and went another way. How did that frustration manifest? And how have you been able to use that and channel that into where you are now? That's a great question. It's manifested through those various escapes. Mm. So the fight, flight or freeze automatic mechanism that we that we have, I believe a neuroscientist friend of mine told me that it's actually set from a really, really young age. Mm. I think there's like an initial set of the, one of those three Fs at like three and then it further cements at seven or something. And I know that my fight, flight or freeze response is flight. For me, if I want to get, if something's not going my way or I want to change something, my immediate automatic reaction is to get away from it so that's what happened at those various kind of full starts Interesting. that attempt to escape to madrid toronto like literally catching flights and actually leaving these places wow okay yeah. i think so that's you, you've really taken that flight element to the, uh, quite to, literally. To the full extent yeah okay <laughs> yeah. wow wow okay really really interesting so you've come back here and you're working three jobs you know, you're doing everything you can to get as far as you can. And at what point do you realize that actually the way of working that's going to serve you best is rather than spilling your time across working for other people, but actually focusing on, on working for yourself? When did that happen? Talk to us about that that switch in mindset. There's been an entrepreneurial spirit within me for quite a while. I went to art school and I used to sneak into the basement of the art school building and uh, screen sh- um, screen print a load of t-shirts that I bought from okay. <laughs> street stores and wrote my sister into modelling to sell um, these, these t-shirts. My first brand, this one was called, wait for it, from the heart designs nice. and the art in the heart was all like capitals <laughs> art. <laughs> so lame, so cheesy. And How old were you at the time? I uh, must have been around 18 ish. Okay, that's acceptable. That, that's, you know, that's acceptable. Well, what goes to show my age as well here is how I went about selling those clothes and the digital marketing at the time, which was literally having a Facebook page, possibly mm-hmm. even posting about it on MySpace. This yeah. is way before Instagram, iPhones, or any of that. So, just that, I think there's, you obviously, I mentioned I went to art school. There's, I think that entrepreneurship is you know, combined with that creativity. It's that urge to create something. Mm. It's wanting to take control. It's to kind of put something out there into the world. And so I had a bit of that in me. Uh, and then actually it was the first proper job that I managed to get in London after nine months of the pulling pints and serving barista coffees where um, that also really reignited that entrepreneurial spirit within me as well because it was a small business. I was really working closely with the founder and CEO. Mm -hmm. I could see all the ins and outs, all the workings. I was basically in charge of the full kind of end-to-end process from taking briefs from the clients. I mean, even before that, the new business, winning the new clients, taking the briefs, managing that project, seeing it all the way through, putting it into billing, reviewing the accounts at the end of the quarter. Mm -hmm. This was all in my early 20s in my first role. So I'm really grateful to my first boss there for so many reasons, but that's one of them to Mm. really give me that first real world insight into how business operates, what happens, because yeah, at the ripe young age of 22, I was not uh, uh, naive, but it was the first exposure I had to to business, to the real world, what actually happened. So a lot really shifted there Mm. for me. And how big was that company? Tiny, like six of us. Yeah. Do you know, it's, it's interesting. I whenever I have the opportunity to give advice to young people, I always say the best thing that you can do is go and work for a really small company, either a startup or even something a bit more established, but something where you're going to be able to do a bit of everything because it's going to help you understand a bit of everything, obviously, but also you're much more likely to be exposed to 
what you're calling, you know, or at least the bit which you think, okay, well, I know this is the bit which either doesn't make me want to, you know, jump out a window on a Sunday night, or actually it's the thing which really, really excites me, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm glad that you've thought that was an yeah. amazing experience too. In a similar vein, my advice that I always give to young people as well is to spend at least like a summer, like a school, you know, school holidays um, in a customer facing role and client, whether it's waitressing, serving, bartending, obviously I mentioned I hustled and had a few of these yeah. different jobs, but the amount that that teaches you as well, how to deal with people, how to handle complaints, how to improve your communication skills, how to build your confidence. So the ideal career roadmap by Stephanie and Roy is go to school, get a job in a bar or restaurant yeah. and then work for a small business. Yeah, love that. And then and set up your own company. Yeah, I mean, you're so right because it's the exposure to the the skill sets and the, you know, the workings of a company, but it's all about people. Yeah. It's all about people. Yeah, so getting totally. that exposure is great. Yeah. Love that. Okay, that's some really good practical advice. <laughs> okay, so on. I want to go back to your story, but on practical advice, as you know, this goes out to uh, 3,000 founders, investors, entrepreneurs. So I would love to pick your brain on a couple things. Mm. Talk to me about where you see, very small topic, very easy question to answer, marketing trends for 2023. You know, where do you see the world going? The way I see it going is something I... I'm so pleased about and could not have come sooner is the digital explosion is finally calming down. So uh, online advertising, PPC, social performance, there's absolutely still a place for it. It's still extremely important. Performance marketing absolutely plays a vital role, but it is not the be all and end all. And what we see day in, day out through Bloom, my agency, is this addiction to short termism. And actually, the VCs who are backing these companies, especially during times like this, where the pressure's really on and we don't have huge timelines to work towards, it just focuses the attention even more so on those short term results. And we always use the kind of food analogy, definitely not a nutritionist by any <laughs> mean, but if you compare it to getting your five a day, your mm. fruit and veg, get some fiber, some grains, versus the mid-afternoon slump where you need a Snickers bar or you need some sh chocolate, that short-term fix, that sugar fix, you can almost use the same analogy with marketing in that respect. So mm. the, the costs are going up. People are realizing now that uh, with the growth of purpose-driven companies and the importance of mission is that Number one, uh, the game in performance marketing is won by those with the deepest pockets. Yes. So the more money you put behind something, the more media budget that you have, then like that's already giving you an edge against the startups. You don't have such deep pockets. Mm. And um, and going back to kind of the purpose and the mission point is you're continuing to fund big tech and you're continuing to line the pockets of the Zuckerbergs yeah. of this world, um, I think around you know eighty percent of the ad revenue or sort of the overall revenue of these companies of Google Meta now is from advertisers. Mm. Obviously, and we've had some brands who have been pulling their spend, who don't want to associate, don't want to align. Uh, I heard about Meta having recently got another fine again for their privacy violations. A big one of that, yeah. Well, I mean. Not to them, but not a big to one, them. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> that that is what it is. Yeah. Subjectively, it would be mm -hmm. big to you and I, of course. And so I think that's something. So it's it was quite a while ago now. When you think about when PPC, when Google Ads, when you know AdWords were first even invented, you know, mm. definitely at least ten years ago now. So that's something that I'm really happy about. Is that all of that excitement, that over reliance on the data driven marketing is calming down. Mm -hmm. I would love to see more of that stomach from uh, not the the entrepreneurs. I think they do have the guts, of course, that's why they're doing what they're doing. But actually more of that stomach from the VC side of things. If it's mm -hmm. a VC backed company, the investors, there needs to be less nervousness and longer lead time. So again, moving away from checking that sat nav and seeing which direction you're heading every two minutes, you mm. need to leave that alone for six, 12, 18 months because not all marketing initiatives are going to be giving you that Snickers bar, mm. short term sugar fix in the afternoon. You need that longer term build in the mix with everything as well. Yeah. It's an amazing point. And you know, it's, it's, 
you're 100 percent right and i love the nutrition um uh, metaphor there uh, and i think they say you know try and get your 30 grains a week 30 different types of oh, plants i haven't heard of that one try and get your 30 different marketing strategies right. or, or, or you know activations out a week as well right um i think it's really interesting and the realistic or, or the reality of the vc model is it is predicated on their portfolio companies achieving that 10 to 20 percent month to month growth right so for a big company with good funding where they can afford to achieve those numbers via going down ppc and performance marketing route but invest simultaneously in long-term strategies whether it's seo youtube whatever it might be um to try and help secure the long-term growth what is your advice to early stage founders who obviously can't do everything at once mm. where would you be focusing that is a great question. So there's a ratio between the long and short to balance. If we very broadly split marketing activities between that short termist performance market, you know, you switch it on, you make a campaign go live, you see the results almost instantaneously versus more of the brand led longer term campaigns. Ideally, you should be working towards more of a 50 50 sort of split, but that's mm -hmm. kind of a few years down the line. Obviously, when you start, to your great point, you are going to be higher up on that shorter term um, end of the ratio. And that makes complete sense because when you're just starting out, you don't even know if the company is going to be yeah. in existence next week. You don't know if you're going to make payroll by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So you, of course, you have to work to those shorter, those shorter time frames. I would say, you know, think, I hate to use that cliche about thinking outside of the box, but look at what are all of the tools that are within your arsenal that you can leverage for success? So, for example, if you've got quite a charismatic founder, can you actually leverage some of that personal brand? Are there ways that you can create content in a really efficient way? There's a lot of repurposing that you can do to get your message out there. Um, so I think you can have a play around with different, you know, maybe guerrilla marketing tactics, levering the team, levering personal profiles, depending on the type of business. In contrast to that, strate I think that's on the tactical side of things in terms of looking at what you can play around with, experiments. On the strategic side, actually take the complete opposite approach and actually really dial in to who exactly are you talking to? What are the specific pain points that you're solving for those people? get really, really niche, really drill down on that strategically and then tactically play around with a bunch of different activities, have fun with it and see what sticks. Super interesting. Really, really cool. And I think one of the really exciting things for entrepreneurs now is the amount of tooling that's out there which will allow you to really accelerate your process for creation, whether it be, you know, generative tools. It, it, it's really just that that time and cost to getting things out there mm. has just decreased so much. Mm. One thing I want to ask you about is, and this may not be, uh, it's obviously an area you'll have an opinion on, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's something which um, you consider yourself an expert in, but SEO, chat GPT, how much is SEO strategy and return from investing in SEO at risk because of the way people are going to start accessing information online? Mm. There's a short term risk. Longer term, it's it does it does decrease. It's not mm. as risky when we start to move on. The reason why is because any tool um, around, you know, AI, ML is all predicated on the past. It's all taking historical data, it's mm. taking information that already exists and it's repurposing that and it's spitting it out in in a way that it thinks is appropriate. And so that's where it's kind of, okay, short term, yeah, it's everyone is going crazy, experimenting with these different tools, having fun with it, playing around, generating all this copy. I've definitely played around with it for different kind of blog posts sure. to get stuff out there. But this is where that interesting conversation comes in around human versus the robots, mm. um, in the human brain versus artificial intelligence. There is only so far it can go. So that originality, the inventiveness, the creativity, that's where humans can still have an edge against that. Really, really interesting. Really, really interesting. And you're right, because even now you can see that it's incredibly limited on trying to look for things post September 2021. Um, so it, it is it is not so good for getting things up to date. Uh, and it might change in the future. But for now, that's a, a really strong one. Right. Um, okay, so let's go back to, to your story. So 
tell us about founding Bloom after mm. was was it straight after leaving that smaller agency? Or no, what? yeah, no. So I I left that agency. It did get to a point where I was a bit big fish, small pond. Went to a larger agency, which was great, and got to work on some top brands uh, across the LVMH portfolio mainly in the luxury sector. And after the best part of a decade working agency side, I was a get frustrated and mm -hmm. wanted to um, go client side and see marketing from the other side of the fence. So managed in not only achieving that and going from agency side to in-house, but also going from independent, not even British owned, but London owned small agencies to a mammoth of a Chinese technology company. And um, they, they're called Meitu. They were at mm -hmm. the time, at least anyway, a global top 10 app developer with their products on over a billion devices worldwide. Wow. And so, yeah, very, very different in a lot of different ways, different sector, different type of company, different culture, nationality. And I was very lucky as well because I joined at the perfect timing, I was the first marketing hire and I think about fourth overall for the UK team that was starting out here. So amazing. I joined just at the time that they were expanding internationally and wanted to take the product over into the West, the Western markets. And it was the best of both worlds, honestly, Roy. It was coming over here very much startup vibes. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, our offices weren't too far from where we're sat now. Nice. And it was just fantastic. It was a small team. It was, again, it harked back to my role in the first agency I mentioned where we could really roll up our sleeves and get stuck in and build something and feel that impact of what you're doing. But then we had the, the backing of HQ that were eight hours uh, ahead of us and speaking Mandarin over on WeChat, yeah. uh, who had the bigger budgets and the success. And there sure. was definitely that brand equity that we could ride on the coattails of. So I was really grateful, even at the time, I was very aware of that privilege, mm. of the benefits of, of both of those things. And I was incredibly lucky to travel out to China as well during that time and actually visit the HQ and see the technologies that they were developing and the image of a mannequin's head in a dark room surrounded by cameras will always stick with me because it was so freaky. <laughs> Sounds terrifying. <laughs> it yeah. was pretty terrifying. Um, so that was that was amazing. And it was really, so it was after that, actually, it was November mm. 2017, uh, the 24th of November, to be precise, exactly a month before Christmas Eve that I officially incorporated Bloom which on paper is not the best time to start a new business when you're heading into Christmas and a bit of a lull. But sure. honestly, like where there's a will, there's a way and yeah. you know, we find ways to make it happen. And I uh, got on the blower basically and hustled and contacted whoever I knew and went to any networking event and did what I could to win our first client. So, so tell me, so obviously you've been working with this amazing company, big budget, super exciting. At that stage, how proud of you are you? Are you at yourself or of yourself uh -huh. you know thinking back to being stuck in Lanzarote being like <laughs> what am I doing to this side I mean do you have that awareness along the way does that help with the gratitude that you have at the time of like I feel so fortunate to be here and obviously worked so hard to be there but do you feel that at that time that is such a great question I love that one as well and funny uh, funny enough no I didn't have that sense of pride I still don't have that sense of pride I, I think that's for a number of different reasons. One of the main ones that comes to mind for me is because I don't want to allow that to become, oh, sorry, I should say, I don't want that to allow me to become complacent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's that fear. I think I know that if I start to relax and let go and start to feel apathetic about things, then it's just a very slippery downward yeah. slope into... So I think there's some of that. It's that for me, pride is very interlinked with that complacency. Yes. I don't want to sit still. I don't want, I want to continue developing and advancing and pushing things forward. And um, I don't know. I think I'm also very aware of the fact that, yeah, you know, luck and coincidences or whatever you want to call it, whether you believe in fate or destiny, some of those th are things that are within our control and there are things that are outside of our control. So some of that still plays a part in it as well. So I think it's being thankful for those things that come your way, definitely practicing gratitude, but not, but recognizing you know some of those other factors that yeah. were at play there. It, it's, it's a really fascinating response. And it's if you would have asked me that question seven months ago, I would have said pretty much the exact same thing. 
And I've been working as much as possible on really trying to understand how mindset interplays and such a fine line, right? Between pride, complacency, confidence, arrogance. Mm. And they're two sides of the same coin. But if you get onto the wrong side of them, it's the bad way, right? And, totally. and it lets the, the negative elements set in. But what I've really been working on the last six, seven months is really working on self-pride and really working on confidence and trying to understand that those can be different from arrogance or, or let yourself get complacent. And you've got to be constantly aware of that part but it's it's just as you said right there are things that we can control things that we can't and we should have immense pride in executing on the things we can control but the total awareness of the luck and everything else that should keep us grounded mm. because we know that it's half the battle but still be totally proud of the things that we did control and the things that we we did and whether that's just effort or showing up whatever it might be but mm. uh, it's a really interesting one and I think one of my passions in life is I want to get people as proud of themselves for the things that they can control as possible mm, I love that so when you then go into setting up bloom at that point is there any feeling of apprehension because you're moving away from something very, very sturdy or as someone who's had three jobs their whole lives, this is just, you know, your bread and butter at this point? I was absolutely bricking it. Yeah. I called my best friend. I was like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Yeah. I had my, could feel the adrenaline coursing through my veins. I was like, oh my God, it's happening. But I always had a backup. I do... I, I understand where people come from when they do talk about like there's no plan B. Like it's just it's plan A. It's all or nothing. Just putting all our eggs in one basket. Like we're going to make this a success. Like there's no other way about it. I uh, I love that. I do. I totally see where they're coming from. Personally, I'm just much more realistic. And to your point, I, um, yeah, I dabbled with trying to flog some T-shirts that I'd screen printed in my art school basement. Yeah. But I'm not the quintessential entrepreneur that you might hear about who never had a, a job in their life and built their first business at 16 or whatever I did come from um you know I had a career where I had a paycheck coming in every month that was the big thing it was like I don't know where my money's going to come from I don't mm. know how I'm going to pay the bills at this point I had a mortgage as well so you do start to get more of that responsibility yeah. so some of the real world kind of stresses come into play there so I I definitely had it back in my mind I was like look I'm not one of those people that I could definitely you know not work for anyone else that's not the case I knew that if I needed to get back onto the interview merry-go-round again if I had to go and find a job then so be it um, I think that just that helped just settle my nerves and just settle my anxiety but yeah I was super super nervous definitely mm. and when <laughs> do you start feeling like right we're onto something like it's going to be fine things are going to be okay Does that ever happen? <laughs> any good, I'll, I'll let you know if I find it I was, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to tell me three months but it's it's funny you asked that because we celebrated our fifth anniversary last November and Congrats. thank you um yeah quite nice that it's it the fact it's late November we kind of tie it in with an early Christmas yeah, thing as well yeah, yeah. so we will, we will celebrate that at the very least right and it was a bit of a milestone just five is a round number and it's funny, I was reflecting on some of those things as well with like, when is it going to feel like I don't have to call up a recruiter? <laughs> when is it going to feel like, okay, things are solid and stable and we're on something and you feel like you're really on solid ground? Mm. There have been moments where, okay, you've got a few contracts under your belt, things are ticking over nicely, but you're always aware that it's only for a limited amount of time. Mm. So... I think that that is the nature of entrepreneurship. It's being uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really, really interesting. Okay, cool. There, there are five questions I ask everyone. Not quick fire or anything. We'll, we'll talk around these, but I'm very intrigued to hear your answers. So the first question for you is, what do you think the single biggest risk you've taken is and what was the outcome? Mm, great question. Um, I do. I love, by the way, the whole theme of risk and love the name of the Pog Big Risk Energy. I absolutely love it. What actually springs to mind is something I heard a VC talk about on a panel event, which was kind of the subjectivity of risk and how, especially from the investment side of things, they're taking risks continually on a daily basis. But actually, due to the research, the due diligence and everything around it, it's 
it's kind of mitigated that. Um, so I'm just stalling and buying some time while I'm thinking about the biggest <laughs> risk that I've ever taken. No, but it's an interesting point. It's an interesting point. And I think sometimes, you know, there, there are, risk is an interesting subject because mm. sometimes risk can be the least risky. Exactly. Thing right. Within finance, right? Exactly. Risk is, you know, you do every single thing you can yeah. to not take risk. Right. And then sometimes it's following your gut. Right? I love that. The riskiest thing you can do sometimes is to not take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. That makes complete sense. Um, interestingly, I think the biggest risk I've ever taken actually is perhaps not in the business world is actually maybe not professionally. I mm -hmm. think it's actually more on um, choice of partner. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that when you're, when you're young, you just have different priorities and you have that naivety. And it's only now that I've learned the importance of actually who you're going to, you know, partner up with in life, you know, whatever mm. you want to, you want to call them. And, um, you meet so in my case I've been in a long-term relationship for over a decade and being in your mid-30s versus your early 20s they're very different life stages sure, yeah. <laughs> and so you know this is a person that you I think it's always risky kind of putting your faith into another person in any case and um and then when you layer on top the the changing priorities the naivety and everything else along with that as well then I think that's that for me just feels like wow, that's actually quite a big risk because that person mm. has transcended jobs and careers and even some friends and things that have, you know, all these other things in life, they come and go. But actually that's someone who's by your side and who's, you know, are, are their goals and longer term ambitions always going to be aligning with yours? Mm. You don't, they don't even know it at the time, yeah. you know? It's one of the most difficult things in relationships, right? And it's such a massive risk. Mm. It is a real massive risk. And it's the beauty of life, mm. right? Is that you take especially on the emotional side of things, you take big, big risks and you take big bets with zero certainty mm. on the outcome. Mm. It feels like such a big one, but... Um, I don't think certainty exists anyway. Mm. I think when you actually get a bit more philosophical and deeper about it, I do... <laughs> It's just the way I'm wired, but every time I cross the street, you know, I get to the other side and I'm thankful for making it alive. Yeah. <laughs> just me being a weirdo, but there are so many things that we just neuroscientifically that mm. our brain just assumes and puts to one side and takes for granted there's so much that we put our trust into you've just arrived here from overseas mm -hmm. you just completely trusted that the pilot was going to arrive you safe and sound yeah i've traver although mid, tur mid turbulence today i wasn't <laughs> you were questioning I, I was yeah i was pretty uh <laughs> yeah pretty confused there but but no i, I agree mm. But I think that's, I think when they are less frequent, when it's outside of the daily routine, and some of those bigger kind of business decisions, that's where the term risk, kind of the, that spotlight is put on it. But I think just circling back to that, you know, sometimes taking no risk is the biggest risk at all. I think mm. that's, that's the best kind of one liner here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, and it's a shame, you know, it's a shame when you see people who have been, <sighs> Not scared, scared's the wrong word, but they've almost been convinced by a system to not take those risks mm -hmm. and not listen mm. to their gut because there are a million rational narratives. There are a million pieces of logic to not take something. But because reality is so fragile, life is so fragile. Mm, exactly. And I think we all wake up to it at some point. And for many people that will be towards the end of their lives when mm. they'll look and be like oh I should have done that mm. right but I think when we all get to that point eventually um but yeah the, I, I think you know Simon Squibb who's a, a friend of mine who is building an ama amazing business right now called Help Bank where he's trying to get um I think you know Simon yeah right? yeah, yeah, yeah he's great so, yeah exactly so trying to get a million people to start their own business I think that's amazing and mm. I think getting people to realize you can always go back and find a job again yeah. you can always go and do something else so um it's exciting it's exciting I, I think on that and again coming back to really extracting some practical tips from this too I think you do need to have my advice would be like have a dose of you know, reality a bit of a reality check as well make sure that you have got some savings that you have got a buffer because especially the climate that we're going into people are getting mm. laid off you know left right and center and so 
don't take that for granted. There's a lot of privilege that can enter the conversation there as well to expect that actually you can automatically just kind of fall back on your feet or run back to mummy and daddy. Like mm. there's a lot of people that don't have that. So there is the rule of thumb to, um, to make sure that you've got six months savings in the bank so that you have got that buffer and you've got the support network in place that you need and come with at least those basics, just, you know, taking care of yourself there with those things checked off, then yeah, absolutely go for it. There are so many benefits to going into entrepreneurship on a macro um, uh, economic level, right down to the micro to your point around don't wait until it's too late and realize that you're on your deathbed. This is your life. You are the one in charge. It is nice and cushy and comfy to have that paycheck at the end of every month. But is life to be sat around and comfortable? Like that's up to the individual to decide. Love it. Okay. Is there anything you wish you did differently? Um, So much. I think that it's very easy to overlay your your wisdom of today onto your previous self. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. right. <laughs> Hindsight is a wonderful thing, absolutely. And the amount that I've learned, um, whether it's life experience or technically or whatever, I've just I I'm aware of how much I've massed I've amassed over the past few years. I always talk about being in business, being a cheaper MBA. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, so it is easy to say, like, oh, if I if I knew this or that, it's it's not really, you know, you are where you are. I think it's about being, being grateful. It is important to take stock and see, OK, how what can I do? But I think at any point in time, you you're always doing the best with the cards that you're dealt. Right. Mm. And so it's kind of let's look, you know, onwards and upwards, basically. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. We are all a combination of our experiences and uh, we wouldn't be here having this conversation without them. Yeah. I think like if I, if I could go back and revisit 16, 17 year old Steph, I would probably advise to actually go a bit more kind of straight on the narrow and actually to uh, go through with the university degree and maybe take a beat and reflect on what it is that I'm interested in, what is it that I'm passionate about, study something that's related mm-hmm. and um, and kind of go through that way because what I have seen is that through people that I've met since living back here in London is the amount of connections and things that are forged in those uni days. So I love hearing about how co-founder relationships were formed and how people met each other and a lot of the time it's because they met first year of uni or it was the first friend that they made at Freshers Week and yeah. so... I don't I don't feel like I've missed out educationally in terms sure. of a degree. <laughs> Love your reaction yeah, there. Yeah. Sure. Obviously. No, no, of course, who yeah. has? <laughs> yeah. Um but in terms of like the network, the friendships, yeah. the connections, that's something that I feel I really had to work from scratch, from zero, moving back to London in my early twenties, not knowing anyone, not having those connections. Um so that would that would be the thing, but Again, like who you know, sliding doors. Where would mm. I be now if I'd done that? I am where I am and this is a great place to be. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. No, I love that as an answer. And I totally agree with you that a lot of people who um are on the the, the narrative of uni's bad and everything else, I agree it's not about the education piece, but it is about just, you know, possible connections and everything else. The life and, experience. And, you know, I see people who have gone so much further who didn't go to university than mm. when, and there's there are no guarantee on outcomes. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, uh, it can be an amazing, fulfilling experience too. What I feel passionately about is that young people need to make these decisions that lay the foundations for their longer term careers at such an early age without the real world um, experiences to base it off. So here in the UK, I know that from about 15, 16, when you start to select your GCSE choices, I think there's about 10 subjects that you can focus in and then you just kind of hone in and hone in. You go from that to A-level where it's three, four maximum down to one subject at university and then you graduate in your early 20s and you get your first job Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then you see what the real world is like after you've done a fucking geography degree Mm -hmm. at like Loughborough (laughs) what the hell (laughs) so that to me is just absolutely ridiculous actually the time that we spend you spend the first two decades of our life in education 
specifically the universe the uni part of things where it's the time and the money that goes into it you know you come out you're in debt it just it's so illogical to me it's just like you don't have you don't even know yourself when you're in your late teens early 20s I mentioned before you've got very different priorities Mm. you're not thinking about how you're going to develop a successful career at that point you're thinking about how you're going to get laid and yeah, you know yeah. like you want to <laughs> those are the things that you care about. how you're going to have fun on the front or you're going to wear on the friday night when yeah. you're going out so um getting that real world experience first if you can do work experience and apprenticeship or talk to people or a placement whatever you want to call it I think it's just so vital to explore the option, see what's out there before you go and commit four years of your life and the money. I don't even know how much it costs these days, mm. but the tuition fees along with everything else alongside it, that, that that's, you know, this does actually relate back to your risk question. That's a big risk for me, but actually it's something that, that stereotypically wouldn't be deemed a risk mm. because it's so, because it's the norm. Mm-hmm. This is again, another example of how we just blindly go along these societal norms. Absolutely. Oh, I'm going to you. Who would question an 18 year old going to uni? Nobody. Mm. Nobody would say, uh, or oh, it's it's even beyond that. It's more a given. It's more like, oh, so what uni are you going to in September? Yeah. As opposed to, actually, this is four years of your life. Yes. And not only, not only four years of your life, but it's four years of your late teens, early 20s. It's that specific part of your life as well that's that's more valuable than four years of your later life, right? Where you've got the energy and you're switched on and you've got all of these things that you take for granted until you get to my age and you get tired all the time. Um, And the the financial burden and everything that comes along with that, that's a big risk. So true. When you put it like that, if an 18 year old came up to you saying, I'm going to take a 50 grand loan and not work for four years, (laughs) you'd be like, okay, have you thought that one through? (laughs) Um, but this yes. is where the well, world is. Well, this is why marketing is everything, right? Yeah, this is where so people don't step back and question these things. Mm. These things that are just, they are taken for granted, these societal norms. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. a big risk for me. A big risk going and studying geography at Uni of Loughborough. I've got nothing against that, but it's... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, very fortunate that wasn't my degree, right? That could have been a really bad choice. Um, I stand by it. Yeah, but you know what? It it is right. History is written by the winners and history dictates university is important and we should all go to university. But it's a very, very interesting one. I mean, this is going to go into such a tangent. Um, But, you know, we, I think why 2023 is very, very interesting is because we are now in an era where it's very, very difficult to deny these narratives are constructed to entrench and secure status quo for lots of people right very very difficult to deny that so it's also very very easy to see that if that's what people have been doing with media for the longest time the only difference is now because of the proliferation of technology social, social media platforms where we can see um, other narratives and counter narratives mm. clearly these counter narratives have existed through the history of humanity but because the history books are the only thing that exists we have no idea how we got here so true we it's have like no when people idea how we say here. about the amount of crime or um the amount of couples who's who don't talk to each other over dinner mm-hmm. it's not true it's just that you can see it now yeah that's the yeah. difference yeah exactly so it's like we accept that oh history was as we think it was until seven years ago right and then it got a big <laughs> then it's a little bit questionable but but till then everything was 100 exactly. spot on. so it's like how are we even here like who knows we have no idea um okay topic for another for another one um next question what scares you uh, snakes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it makes is me that feel in the business world sleep. or more in the e- ecological environment? Ecological is more of that fear. Snakes in the business world is more of a really soul crushing, disappointing. Why have you chosen to behave in that way as a human on this planet? We're mm. spinning around the atmosphere and we've only got a short amount of time on this world. Why would you go and mm. behave in that way? Um, but no, other business fears. Um, 
I think anything that's to do with other people in terms of like team members, I, I, I do actually pride, one of the things I do pride myself on is when I take people under my wing and look out for them, I guess there's that kind of nurturing feeling that comes there. I think there's a fear of what's going to happen to them. Um, but other than that, yeah, I think that kind of covers it. Amazing. Okay. What are you proudest of? Um, I think getting to this point in business is something that there's another voice in my head that has had to come up and say, look, you've come this far and there have been all of these odds stacked against you. So there's a very reluctant part of me. It's like, oh, okay, I guess that's an accomplishment. Um, but just in terms of what I mean by that specifically is having built a fully self-funded bootstrapped business we spoke about this before as well I have no external investment mm -hmm. this isn't this isn't that type of business it's not a VC backed high growth tech company like yours which is amazing it's something that literally I invested um, a small amount of money into uh, with my MacBook which my trusty MacBook that's still with me is doing me well today Love which was that. also you know that was also part Christmas gift from my parents and family when I set up Bloom back in 2017 and the fee I had to pay my accountant to get the business incorporated and everything from that goes back to what you're saying about really putting yourself up by your socks and mm. you know hustle's a dirty word these days but I did I hustled and I did what I could off my own back blood sweat and tears to build up the business to find clients to find talent to build all of that so um so the fact that we are now over five years old the fact that we were still in existence, number one, as a self-funded company, the other thing, the other kind of odd that stacked against us in this situation as well is the fact that we're not only a marketing agency, but we focus on brand marketing, which goes back to this, you know, everyone wants the short term fixes. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of amazing performance marketing agencies who are doing phenomenally well and they are experiencing much higher growth than we are. They're constantly hiring people. So definitely have the green monster that comes out from time to time and sees how well those, those guys are doing. Don't we all, don't we all. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I'm not the only one. Um, and I, I do, I, I would argue that it is an easier sell because you have got the, the numbers and the data and the analytics and everyone gets it and you yeah. switch on a campaign and you see the results. So, um, so the nature of the type of work that we do, you know, we're a brand marketing agency. We are also the other layer on top of that as well is that we are in the startup space. Mm -hmm. And just like when I start to go down that path, I question, do I want to make things any harder for myself? You know, like tough pitch. It it's is a, a tough, tough pitch. It's yeah. a tough pitch. So um but you know, the world's a big enough place, the pie's big enough for all of us. When you this I think goes back to the the importance of having that niche of knowing exactly what you're doing, what is that pain point that you're solving, even if it's for a very defined segment of the target audience, it's still your target audience mm. and it's still a slither of the pie that you can own. So yeah, I think that's what I'm proudest of. The fact that I've overcome those challenges, the fact that I've built up the business and we've been going for over five years, as I mentioned, despite everything that's kind of come our way during that time. Yeah, no, it's incredible. One practical question so and and maybe this is going to be a really useful one for you who um sorry for you for founders who are listening to this and love what you're saying but putting their hat on for a second mm. how does a founder explain roi on this mm. type of investment to their investors mm, that's a great question so Brand marketing or the power of brand can actually be measured in a number of different ways. A lot of people think that it's impossible to measure. A lot of people think that, again, with a performance campaign, you can see who's clicked and the cost per conversion and everything else. With the power of brand, you've got certain metrics like branded search terms, for example. Um, what I would uh, argue is more powerful is I'm sure you're familiar with the sales and marketing funnel, right? Mm -hmm. Where you've got like awareness at the top and you go through the various uh, leaky stages of that funnel all the way through to conversion. Instead of talking about the funnel, I think we need to be talking about the hourglass, which mm. actually is post-conversion, is actually once you've got those clients, customers, downloads, whatever you want to call it, once you've got them over the line, is actually not only then the retention that follows that and then the loyalty, but actually the advocacy. Um, what that then leads to is the holy grail of marketing, 
and this will be music to investors ears as well for the founders, which is a zero pound CPA, aka word of mouth marketing. Mm -hmm. So if you've got somebody that has converted, they've tried, they've had an experience with your with your brand, they've purchased your product or service, they've stuck with you and they've loved it so much and the brand has resonated with them on an emotional kind of level, they will feel compelled to then go and tell their friends about it. That is also one of the basic ingredients for the viral me mechanics as mm -hmm. well, which everybody also wants. You don't get that by switching on a basic campaign where you look and sound like everybody else. Um, I'm not one for USBs and differentiation, by the way. That's also another conversation. I think that the marketplace is way too saturated and crowded to constantly be different. And mm -hmm. I think that competition can move quickly enough to just copy what you're doing. And I think trying to constantly just be different for different sake is not the winning strategy. Instead, yeah. it's about um, being distinctive. It's about knowing who you are. It's focusing on that value proposition and delivering that uh, that added value and going the extra mile wherever possible. So um, I think it's also you know, going back to the sales marketing funnel versus the hourglass. I think that is also very natural for startups or early stage businesses in the early days. Acquisition feels like oxygen. Mm. All your focus is like we were saying before about you don't know if the business is going to be around in a few months' time. You don't know if you're going to make payroll by the end of the month. So, of course, you are focused on just getting those people through the door. So I think as soon as you're ready to start thinking about, okay, now what do we do? With the, we've got them. We've done all of that hard work. We've got everything that brand has helped, you know, encourage that whole process. Now what can we do to not only retain them, but help them advocate and spread the word? So again, there's very practical metrics that founders can take to their investors across branded search terms, word of mouth, uh, brand memorability, perception as well in terms of brand association. Um, and it, I mean, the list is endless, honestly, with the amount of benefits that brand can drive. Um, profits being a big one as well. Your mm. speed to profitability. If you've got a strong brand, then people will pay for that. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can translate the fluffy stuff to to tangible numbers and actually speak speak numbers to the money people. Amazing. That's incredible, practical, actionable advice for our audience. Fantastic. Thank you. So where can people find you? Uh, at Steph Melodia on pretty much everything. Uh, I mentioned before, I'm the only Stephanie Melodia in the world, so it shouldn't be too hard to find me. Uh, feel free, connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on Instagram, check out Bloom, uh, bloomltd.co.uk is the website. We've got tons of resources and information about uh, the power of brand and speaking numbers to the money people as well on the blog. So check that out if you want to uh, deep dive on that too. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Steph. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching the episode. And if you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe below so that you can support the podcast and we can keep on bringing you amazing new guests. If you want to see the other amazing episodes in this podcast, click into our series section. As ever, if there are any other guests or topics you want us to explore, just let me know in the comments and we'll do our best to bring someone in.